Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to Canada, where it's really, really cold. And in another edition of the Rotopros.com Best DFS Show that just happens to come at you around 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. Welcome to an EPL breakdown for the midweek Wednesday slate for. February 27th, 2018. It's coming at you here the morning of. Uh, so my first recommendation for this video, turn the speed up, whether 1.5, 2K, or 2 times, whatever you got to do, get the speed going in case you are limited on time. Second of all, I just want to quickly touch on uh, how cold it is here right now. It's minus 16 without the wind chill. Uh, with the wind chill, it feels closer to minus 24 degrees outside. And uh, the wind right now is actually blowing around, uh, let's go, uh, kilometers to miles, uh, gusting around 60 to 70 kilometers an hour outside right now. So yeah, it is absolutely frigid, uh, bone freezing. You can't stay outside for more than two minutes at a time. My dog's furious because he hasn't got to go outside in two days uh, It's it, it, to play for two days. It's brutal. He, he just wants to have fun. So quickly want to touch on yesterday's slate for one real reason not because i want to brag but i had a really good slate i almost qualified for the king of the pitch i was a few minutes away uh the calvert lewin goal caught me at the end of uh, the everton game which sent sasson to the king of the pitch congratulations sasson actually beat me in both the corner kick uh took first place and uh the king of the pitch qualifier uh it was really close i was leading basically up until the the final few minutes there were calvert Lou and got the goal and that sent other people ahead and he, he had me covered with char now the real reason i want to talk about this is the gpp strategy i took and basically i'm calling it my red coast strategy and uh, if anyone's ever played DFS soccer, you've probably run across the guy, Redcoat85. Redcoat, if you're out there, I highly doubt you're watching me, but absolute legend, probably one of the top DFS players for soccer. And uh, I've studied his GPP play for a really long time now, basically three years, hardcore following everything he does. And I tried to mimic his strategy this late, which was uh, just basically uh, take a, a script that none of the people are going to be on. It doesn't really necessarily matter the players, more mattering the script that you choose. And in particular, uh, that was building around Carlin Grant of Huddersfield. Now, it didn't necessarily mean that Carlin Grant had to have a great game, which he almost did. I think he was credited with an assist. Obviously, Opta didn't. But uh, the main point here is that by taking Carlin Grant, who was only 1.6%, Owned in the king of the pitch that set me up for a script build that was completely unique uh, compared to a lot of other people especially when I started taking other people like Longstaff who was 50% owned uh, Digne was actually 40 uh, Sigurdsson uh, I believe uh, was around uh, I can't actually remember Sig uh, Richie was tw uh, 20 and uh, Harvey Barnes uh, was the other guy uh, really that set me apart he was only 12% uh, owned in the, the uh, king of the pitch so yeah, uh, the, and uh, Shara was actually super, super low owned, which was really surprising. And I wasn't obviously expecting a goal, but he's been playing incredible. Uh, Newcastle's been playing really well, fit with Debraca. I felt this was a script that not many people would be on. I didn't really worry so much about the players, in particular, long staff. Harvey Barnes, Carlin Grant, and I knew Rich Allison's been garbage as of late. Uh, that's really what hurt me. I could have basically taken any other player other than him and I would have probably won. But the point here is that don't build for players, build for scripts. Especially uh, this slate, I believe that uh, rather than picking uh, team stacks to go with, if you're not looking that route, there's different things to go with this slate that uh, I think could be really interesting and uh, really valuable in terms of combinations uh, because you can't own everyone at once. So yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, oh, that uh, just jumped right back into that. Let's try that again. There we go. Let's jump right into the slate here today. Really excited for this slate. Uh, first up, we have uh, Bournemouth making the trip from the South Coast into London to play Arsenal. We have Fulham making the trip from London down to Southampton to play Southampton. Manchester United making the trip from Manchester into London to play Crystal Palace. Spurs making the trip a uh, very close trip uh, derby game against Chelsea. Watford making the trip from London into Liverpool to play Liverpool and the final game of the slate is West Ham uh, making the trip from London 
up to Manchester to play Manchester City. So, like I said, we have Arsenal. We have Manchester United. We have both Tottenham and Chelsea. We have Liverpool and we have Manchester City. What this means basically is that we have a ton of elite salaries to choose from. And more specifically, you're not going to be able to get every single player into the same card. Uh, a lot of the way, a lot of the ways to do this is to take a high salary and pair it with a lower salary, especially in the forward position, and generally try to punt in uh, numerous different other places. Uh, but this slate, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can build where uh, you can take two different forwards like Salah and, uh, for example, Sterling, who's only 8.8k, or for example, Lacazette, who's only 8.7k. And Aguero, for example, or you see what I'm doing there. The 8K range for forward this slate is actually pretty jam packed. And depending how certain teams line up, uh, Sun's absolutely in play, Sadio Mane's in play, Bernardo Silva's in play. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of names here that are totally in play this slate that pair really well and set you up for a unique script uh, as long as you don't game stack now or team stack now i think a, there is a lot of value in doing that too especially with someone like arsenal or man city uh I, both game stacking and team stacking but um yeah let, let's just jump right into this slate here i don't want to waste too much more time i think there's also going to be a lot of profit margins we're going to talk about here uh players that you can pick that not only are going to garner points from what they do but their points will directly correlate to other people losing points or implied totals on their end of their card so that's really my two goals this slate is player margins and uh different combinations that many people won't be owning because they're too busy worried about getting all of one team into the same card and i'll touch very shortly here on what uh what team that is so yeah let's uh jump right in first game on the slate we have uh bournemouth making the trip to arsenal i'm really excited for this game for a couple of reasons firstly bournemouth are easily uh, outside of like, <clears throat> excuse me, Fulham having an atrocious record and Huddersfield being really bad, Bournemouth are the worst away team in the league. It's not even remotely close. They're, they're atrocious when they're away from home. They're getting beat by multiple goals consistently throughout the entire season. So there's no reason not to assume here Arsenal can't score multiple goals on Bork which would uh, make him minus, which has been kind of happening a little bit lately. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but when it does happen, uh, you can expect it to happen again because it has happened. So I'm not saying a minus game. I'm definitely saying Bork isn't my value keeper of the slate. And the same can be said for Leno because, or Leno, uh, he concedes at just a consistent rate as Bournemouth, just not to such an extreme rate, especially away from home or comparatively at home. Uh, Arsenal do concede, but they don't get blown out. Now, from 5.7K, you really do need a clean sheet. Is it possible? Yes, I think there's better ways to attack uh, this game than the defense on either side. That being said, Nathaniel Klein is definitely one of my favorite cash defenders of this slate from only 3.8K. I think he makes a lot of sense. Uh, he makes a lot of his points from defensive peripheral statistics, so you don't really need him to go ahead and get uh, a huge game uh for, uh, from crosses in order to find any kind of points. Now, on the other side of the field, I think Cole Sanic has an excellent floor from 4.8K. I'm a little bit less interested in him because I would rather choose the lower uh, salary and choose my salaries up high and chasing goals with those combinations I was speaking of earlier. But uh, Cole Sanic does make sense. So if you are interested in getting some Arsenal exposure here because they really should... Uh, find ceilings across the board against a team like Bournemouth, who should allow up to four goals. Uh, that's my that that's where I'm expecting this to go. Arsenal should score four goals. So don't expect Klein to do much in GPP, but in cash, I think he totally makes sense. If you want six to eight fantasy points, he should be able to do that from 3.8K. I'm going to avoid the midfields on both these teams. Uh, for the most part, Bournemouth, I don't think they're going to be able to garner enough points from the midfield to really warrant their still fairly high salaries, despite the fact that Arsenal should concede. And Arsenal, their minutes are absolutely atrocious. Across the board, maybe Mkhitaryan could see 90 minutes, and I wouldn't hate that, but then again, 
8K, and there's tons of many other different options, especially up front for that same kind of salary, which you can pivot to, which really make a lot more sense across the entire slate, not just uh, this team. But Arsenal kind of picked up Dan Suarez to fill in Aaron Ramsey when Aaron Ramsey leaves this season, but they're going to keep riding Aaron Ramsey and not give Dan Suarez a chance. Um, Awobi won't see 90 minutes, rarely does. Uh, the same could be said for Zakatoria and Genduzi. If Stanislas is out, that's going to open up some doors. But like I said, that's more of a trap for me this late. And I'm really not interested in Bournemouth from that spot. Now, one place I am really interested in, particularly game stacking this late, I think you can game stack this, uh, is taking both uh, Lacazette and Josh King. Now, first, I wanted to talk on why you shouldn't take OBS. And the very simple fact is that Outside of his goals, he doesn't really do very much at all. And I'm not really interested in taking that risk from 9.9K. Thing is with Salah, you take Salah, he doesn't score a goal. He's still going to get you 8 to 10 fantasy points. That's not ideal, but it doesn't ruin your day. Uh, Obbs will absolutely like ruin your card. He'll absolutely ruin your weekend if you have him any kind of exposure rate. So 9.9K isn't the place I'm looking to go where comparatively Lacazette's playing 90 minutes scoring tons of goals costs less than 9k shooting the ball enough to even be cash viable he isn't my top cash forward play by any means but I do believe him to be cash viable if you happen to fall on him uh, you shouldn't be falling on anyone at 8.7k but if you happen to totally playable in terms of GPP both these teams stand to score Josh King's salary is cheap enough where if you happen to score, he's going to set you up to take down a GPP when you pair him with someone else who's going to score two or more goals, uh, whoever that may be. Uh, now, you can definitely, that could be Lacazette uh, very easily. He's definitely one of my favorite GPP forward plays of the slate, uh, no question. Uh, but now on the other side of that, Josh King could just as easily go out and get a penalty shot and a goal. He got two penalty shots last game and just missed one of them. So, again, uh, this goes back to what I said earlier, the combinations. Taking Josh King with an expensive salary is up there for me this late. Is it my favorite low salary forward punt to go with? No, it isn't. I think there's one more we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but in terms of someone you can go with, yes, you can go with Josh King this late, but it isn't my favorite low low salary. Uh, but uh, I like Lacazette for either format. Uh, I like him to do great things this late from only 8.7K in DraftKings. And uh, in terms of the final score, I think it's probably going to be 4-1, 4-2 Arsenal. I'll be really surprised surprised if Arsenal uh, score less than three goals and uh, that's a lot mind you I could do that too at two goals but I feel that is a little bit um, too conservative and I'll be really surprised if Bournemouth don't score a goal this slate uh, so yeah let's say 3-1-4-1 Bournemouth next game on this slate we have Fulham traveling to Southampton um, just like Bournemouth we follow this up right away with uh, quite simply, the worst away team in the league. Undisputably, easily, no question. Uh, Fulham hasn't won away yet this season. They've only drawn twice and lost the rest of their away games. They've been an absolute disaster away from home. Furthermore, when you consider that they've sunk almost 200 million U.S. dollars into the team this uh, this season. So, yeah, it's... Uh, a disaster right now. The thing is, though, much like Huddersfield last slate, um, it Fulham are a team that shouldn't lose here on out. They should eventually win a game. Will they? No, that's not guaranteed. But should they? Yes, they are good enough to do that. So unless they just continue to see horrible bad luck from the rest of the way, they should get a chance to win a game eventually. And if you're to stack up the different opportunities they're going to get to go out and win a game, Southampton's one of those games where they really should have a chance to win that, that game. Now, is it going to come on the back of a clean sheet? Absolutely not. Um, I don't see that happening. Now, at the same time, Southampton doesn't really have a lot of viable DFS options. This late. We'll go over it shortly, obviously. But it doesn't really appeal to the defensive aspect of Fulham. Now, Callum Chambers, if he does start as a midfielder, is an elite cash option, especially this slate from only 3.6K. It sets you up onto a building script that's not only going to be fairly unique for either format, because uh, you only really need eight fantasy points from these guys 
for either format. And that's very attainable from half-decent games just from defensive peripheral stats. So it isn't necessarily the most popular way to go, but I don't mind it this late when everyone's chasing the Trent Alexander-Arnolds and the Ashley Youngs and the so on and so forth, which both happen to be really good plays. These are just this is just another kind of interesting pivot to try and chase more goals, which I see happening a lot more from the big six uh, being in the same slate. So I'm not really interested in uh, a clean sheet chase. Keep it to cash. Uh, Chambers makes sense for cash. Outside of that, though, you really have to avoid Fulham. Schurler has been sick, so he's not even really guaranteed to get full 90 minutes. Sessegnon is expected to either sit or be sat eventually throughout the game. Uh, they've brought in a bunch of new guys, so their minutes are completely all over the place. And you can look at uh, someone like Ryan Babel for 6.1K. Uh, that isn't the worst idea. He had a good game last slate, so I don't hate it. I'm afraid of a little bit recency bias, though I will flat out say Ryan Babel is a good player. He isn't just someone that is going to float in through the league and do whatever. He's going to consistently do things in DFS. Uh, he did so when he played for Turkey in the Champions League a couple of years ago. So, Or I should say a Turkish side, excuse me a couple of years ago so Mitrovic is in the same boat where um, he's broken the slate repeatedly and from 5.7k uh, he's in the group with me in the Josh Kings with if you're looking to pair someone uh, you can absolutely do it with him because he's broken multiple slates this season and Southampton isn't a team to stop someone whether Mitrovic or any kind of decently calibered player from breaking the slate. So it's just another place to go if you're looking to um, pair that high forward with a really cheap guy. Uh, Mitrovic is definitely up there. He isn't my favorite place to go, but uh, like I said, uh, in the Josh King group of that interesting uh, little combo play. In terms of Southampton, <clears throat> it's very simple for me. If Angus Gunn starts, he's probably my keeper play of the slate for a couple different reasons. The first is because he has an awesome name. We got it out of the way. Second of all, um, he's actually an incredible goaltender. Very quickly go over Angus Gunn. He, I compared him in the past for any football fan. It would be like if Tom, if uh, Drew Brees and Peyton Manning had a son. Uh, that was coached, or excuse me, or if uh, you had a son that was coached by both Peyton Manning and uh, Drew Brees uh, throughout their entire life uh, and end up being a quarterback in the NFL. That's who Angus Gunn is. He's been surrounded by the top keeper coaches his entire life. I've been preaching this guy for months on end, waiting for him to get his chances. He's slowly getting them. He is a good keeper. Fulham's a very bad team, especially away from home, and hasn't won away yet this season. Uh, could they draw? Yes, very possible. But Angus Gunn from 5.3K, if he gets the start, is absolutely in play. Now, to further that... Um, so the Southampton defensive stack with Angus Gunn in the net is probably my favorite defensive stack of the slate. To, to further that, further that, Matt Target or Ryan Bertrand, whoever ends up starting on the left-hand side, is 100% viable by themselves in cash because Fulham allow a gazillion crosses. Valerie, if he starts on the right, is absolutely viable. As mentioned, Fulham allow a gazillion crosses. But as we get into the midfield, it's a little bit more concerning for me. Most notably around Ward Prowse, who should be a cash play. But from 7.2K, there's just so many different options in this massive slate. Like Christian Eriksen is only a few hundred more. And you can't try and tell me that Chelsea right now, in their current state of affairs, is going to prevent Christian Eriksen from doing something from that same salary point. Now, you can easily say, well, Fulham's not going to stop anyone from doing anything from that salary point and that is true but um it's just it's more comfortable to go with a superstar like Erickson than a team like Southampton who has repeatedly burned DFS users for multiple seasons from this very position uh so that's my warning Ward Prowse absolutely viable is he my go-to absolutely not uh Holberg 
is in that same kind of realm of he's just cheap enough to be viable, but he isn't quite doing enough yet. If he catches a good game, he's cash viable from 5.7K, uh, but he isn't my go-to guy this slate. And the forwards you kind of have to stay away from entirely. The only way this works out is if both Charlie Austin and Shane Long and I should also mention Nathan Redman on the wing, all start together at the same time. If this all three occur at the same time, you can roll with some Charlie Austin, and I really don't mind it. <clears throat> he has the skill to be a viable player. Uh, he just hasn't seen the minutes on a team to make him viable yet. Shane Long is a really good guy. Thumbs up to Shane Long uh, being a nice guy, but he's only scored like two goals in literally five years of professional football for both uh, club and national team. Like, not a huge goal scorer. And, yeah, Nathan Redmond is primarily a winger, so if we can get him on the wing, we don't have to worry about him coming up and taking forward minutes. Uh, so, yeah, go with Charlie Austin if you're able to, but you really shouldn't be able to. You really shouldn't be able to. Fulham's going to concede, though. This is the thing. Uh, so it's going to come from somewhere, and it's probably going to come from more than once. So I don't hate the idea of Ward Prowse in GPP because I think Southampton do have a ceiling. The issue is that they're so inconsistent as a team that I can't rely on them in cash to necessarily take advantage from their salary points where other people from their salary points are going to take advantage. Final score, Southampton 2, Fulham 1, maybe 2-2, two, two, maybe 1-1. One, one. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, this ends up as a draw. But what I'm actually going to be betting on is a 2 nothing Southampton win uh, and an Angus Gunn shutout chasing that trifecta at the back of Southampton, their wingbacks, whoever the wingbacks may end up being, who usually, I should mention to avoid confusion for anyone who's new, uh, who usually play up as higher as wingers. So uh, you'll notice that if you're looking at any kind of formations on Google or something like that. So yeah, um, 2 nothing Southampton win. Next game on the site, we have Man United traveling to Crystal Palace. I'm really excited for this one. This is the game of the slate for me. This is the humdinger of stance that you're going to be able to take and going to be able to set yourself up to make all sorts of money. So let's pretend for a second that Angus Gunn isn't playing and Southampton is slightly downgraded in terms of defensing. Uh, defensive, excuse me. So... The long and short of this is Crystal Palace home games this season have been the astronomically lowest scoring home games in EPL history in the league. Sellers Park has seen, I think it's 21 or 22 or very low 20s goals total, total goals so far this season. Um, all their games are really low scoring. Now that doesn't necessarily mean... Crystal Palace is going to go out there and um, do things. Uh, this could be a very low scoring game, which to me immediately says defense. Now, the big stand here is that this is going to be a huge slate. There's going to be a lot of people playing, and I think there's going to be a lot of square plays going into this slate. One of the biggest square plays for me this slate is the old news that Man United is on fire. Yes, they are on fire, but they're also coming into this slate absolutely decimated by injuries. Uh, basically, last slate... Uh, against Liverpool, they barely got out of halftime uh, with 11 guys. They used all their subs, and Marcus Rashford had to play the rest of the game hurt. So there's a really good chance that Rashford won't be playing. All these guys absolutely definitely aren't playing. They got hurt during the Liverpool game. So we're looking at guys like Alexis Sanchez getting 90 minutes. Now there's two ways to look at that. You can look at that one is either we're going to get value from 6.2k or two alexis sanchez has been a waste of talent for the better part of two years on man united and despite lots of chances hasn't come up to the live to those chances now the vast majority of square players are going to be on play one where uh they're getting tons of value on a man united play for 6.2k in a game that's going to be super lucky to see three total goals so yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of value and uh, warrant in fading Sanchez 
and Paul Pogba the slate, which is a huge stand. Everyone's going to be on Paul Pogba. He's going to be the most popular player this slate, and a lot of people are going to be building their builds around getting Paul Pogba into the slate because the biggest square play of them all is that Crystal Palace is a bad team, and they're not. News flash, game over. Crystal Palace is no longer the Palace of the past. They've moved on, and they now have enough skill to compete with any team on any given game, especially at home where they're able to shut down a lot of high-scoring teams. Now, when the ownership drops onto someone like Pogba from 9.3K, a few things could happen. Now, I'm not saying he's going to fail. That's not the case at all. He is the kind of player who I will talk about later that will get 20 fantasy points off a goal uh, simply because he'll already have eight or nine fantasy points just from things he does. Now, my real hope is that he doesn't get a goal, one, and finishes with eight or nine fantasy points, which from 9.3K in GPP will absolutely slay his 30 to 40% ownership, or B, um, he doesn't really see a ceiling even with a goal he'll still finish with 14 fantasy points because crystal palace games are so low scoring that's my hope i don't really see my second plan coming through it's probably the first where he's going to score a goal finish with 20.4 fantasy points and you're just going to have to try and compete with his raw points uh but i'm really betting on the second coming true where Crystal Palace games are so low scoring and people aren't expecting that and they are buying into lots of goals. And to further that, uh, without Rashford and Martial and you're relying on Sanchez, Lukaku simply hasn't been good enough, plain and simple. And even from a DFS standpoint, if you wanted to take him, he's lucky to get three or four fantasy points above that 12 fantasy points. So let's say he scores a goal and gets 12, 12.5. At the end of the game, his max ceiling is like 16 points. And raw points, that just won't cut it. Maybe from 6.8K you can make the argument that it's viable, but I think like those Josh Kings and those other five less than 6K guys can do just as well, if not more, uh, from their cheaper salaries and allow you to still spend up on other guys not named Paul Pogba. So the first point here is that this is going to be a low-scoring game which means that you immediately can rely on either keeper. It just so happens that David DeGay is playing top of his game again right now, hasn't conceded in three straight games, um, just a, a fire goaltender, and he's going to see saves because Crystal Palace at home are capable of getting shots on net. <clears throat> Ashley Young, to further that, is another excellent cash play this slate at uh, only 5.4K. Uh, his salary is just enough at, at a cheap enough spot where you can use him and DeGay in cash, and you're not breaking the bank, while at the same time, you're still allowing yourself lots of <coughs> salary left over, excuse me, and you're not even forced into using someone like Lacazette. I'm just keeping him there because I really like him this slate. So... The theory here is that if it is a low-scoring game, Man United, obviously, you can go with their defensive stack, uh, DeGay Young, and it works out. Now, to converse that, though, if United are getting all the ownership and they aren't scoring or scoring enough, then the profit margin on Guaida this slate is going to be absolutely massive to counter that Pogba ownership. Basically, Pogba doesn't score and finishes under 12, 12. If he finishes under 12 to 14 fantasy points, you win with Guaida. Um, because statistically speaking, he should otherwise be successful unless Lukaku or Sanchez has a good game or, or a re really weird game happens. But in, in terms of like the basic thinking here, uh, from a game theory perspective, Guaida should be very valuable this slate. Um, now, to, to, to further that, you can take someone like Van Anholt from 3.9K who loves to shoot the ball and loves to score against bigger teams. Uh, so, yeah, I have absolutely no issue with this in cash uh, simply because with Man United's loads of injuries, ownership, they're coming down from their honeymoon with uh, Solskjaer. So this isn't something that's going to last forever for United. They've kind of been punching above their weight. They've still been a great team, but they've taken a few punches at this point and they're, they're, they're bruised up. This isn't, they're not coming into this perfect. And whenever we add into the fact that Palace are low owned, they've been playing really, really, really well as of late. 
and their home team home games are generally low scoring games that all adds up to a situation where you can take Palace and they're just ultra valuable this late. Like crazy, crazy valuable. Does that mean they're a surefire to work through this? No. But their value is just through the roof this late. Outside of Southampton, uh, who I think will be a little bit chalky in comparison to Palace, I think Palace are probably the sharpest plays this late. That's really risky to say, uh, but I, I... I'm totally bought into this and that Man United won't score more than two goals because they're missing so many people because they're at Palace and because uh, they're kind of coming down from the Solskjaer honeymoon. So I don't know if, I don't know if Palace has enough to win this game uh, because not only do they need to score, they need to hold it. I think this is going to be a zero, zero draw and uh, the, the vast majority of, uh, ownership on United will fall on Paul Pogba because people will see him as the only guy United has uh, and that deserves ownership and given all the things Palace is doing and has done that's just not the case this late so 0-0 draw get your goaltenders from this game get your defenders from this game don't be afraid even to game game stack defense this game I think that's even a viable GPP stack because at the end here you're going to have upwards of three six nine points uh, of uh, clean sheet bonuses coming your way uh, it's just something I'm interested in so yeah uh, zero zero draw next game on the slate we have uh, a really interesting game that's got me kind of confused I'm not quite sure how to take it Spurs at Chelsea so Here's my my breakdown of this game. Spurs has been much better away from home than they have been at home. Chelsea has been spectacular at home. Borderline Liverpool good at home. Uh, Chelsea has been really, really, really bad as of late. But so has Spurs. And they lost to Burnley last slate away. So I'm not necessarily set on Spurs having enough this slate to necessarily overpower Chelsea, who aren't doing very good either and probably aren't going to score more than two goals. So this game is probably going to finish like a 2-1-1-1 kind of game. That's that's my breakdown. Uh, I'm not entirely sure on that. Uh, Like other games, I'm sure Angus Gunn, if he's in the net, has one of the highest clean sheet props of the slate. Uh, I'm sure... The Crystal Palace Man United game will be super low scoring. I'm sure Arsenal will score multiple goals. I'm not sure about this game script. Uh, it's a very strange game. Both teams line up very oddly. Chelsea is on a very poor run right now, like really, really bad. They haven't been beating anybody. Uh, if you didn't hear what happened, basically the rundown is Chelsea and City played in the League Cup final. Uh, over the weekend. Uh, They didn't play English Premier League soccer. They played the League Cup final. And leading up to the penalty shootout, the coaches tried to take off Kepa, the goaltender, who was hurt. Now, Kepa, thinking that they were trying to take him off because he was hurt, refused to come off the field. And it created a massive scandal. Long story short, as a player telling the story, you, when you're told to come off the field, you come off the field, unless you never want to play again. Uh, it really wouldn't surprise me if Chelsea started uh, Calabero this game. Uh, Cablero, Cablero, uh, yeah, Willie. Let's call him just Willie because that is his first name. Uh, so, really wouldn't surprise me if they started Willie this game. And I'll be straight up, Frank, he is nowhere comparable to an EPL standard of keeper. So if he's in the net and not Kepa, uptick on Harry Kane, uptick on Son, massive uptick on Christian Eriksen, who we'll talk about here shortly, uh, just across the board. So Chelsea are in disarray. They're not in a good place as a team. And if you look at their stats, you'll say, wow, at home, they're incredible. But unless you're reading the news and watching the games, you won't know that their their locker room is completely asphalted right now. They're in serious trouble. Uh, no one has anything uh, good to bring to the table. So this is the issue right now with Chelsea. And Spurs haven't been good enough to counteract that. So it's like... Yes, you can jump on some Spurs here. Let's talk about Spurs because they are viable outside of their their clean sheet chase, which never is really viable. Now, Hugo Lloris is more talented than his 
um, his salary presents. The issue to this is that Spurs just don't keep a lot of clean sheets. And Chelsea, though borderline and capable at the moment, is probably capable enough to score a goal on Spurs. At least once, which will ruin Hugo Lloris, even from 4.6k. Especially when guys like Agueda and David De Gea are getting clean sheets. So, Danny Rose does make sense from 5.3k, but... I think he's just as likely to finish with six to eight to maybe nine fantasy points without an assist as Callum Chambers or especially Nathaniel Klein is. Um, I think he's just as... See, like, don't look at these where it's like Wolves cross the ball, so he's not going to get his defensive press for old tackles and interceptions. Uh, Cardiff cross the ball. Chelsea don't cross the ball. That's the kind of team that literally, like Arsenal, are not going to cross the ball and give him the defense. Uh, West Ham, same idea. They're going to give the defense, just like Arsenal. Uh, Everton cross the ball, so he had a slightly weaker game. Uh, Liverpool, obviously, you're not going to get good scores against them. So, yeah, um, the point here is that Danny Rose is a fine play if you want to join the masses. If you want to block people, if you're afraid someone else is going to have Danny Rose, then by all means, take Danny Rose. But this slate is so packed with options, there's no reason to buy into one player like that and put your eggs into one basket, uh, especially with the goals that are going to come this slate compared to a guy who's really unlikely to get a clean sheet. So, yeah, there's not a lot of ceiling on Danny Rose unless he does like get an assist or multiple assists, which is always it is DFS. I'm not going to deny that. So it's just I think there's other viable options from 2,000 less, as you see on the board here already. Now, Christian Erickson is just too cheap. Unlike Loris, the ceiling is far more attainable for Erickson, especially against a team like Chelsea who not only will draw lots of ownership because people think Chelsea are untouchable at home, but also because uh, Erickson's salary is just going to save you tons of money on his floor. His floor really shouldn't change that much. Um, He's going to see 90 minutes. He really should get double digits without too much issues. I see an assist in his future from a set piece. Chelsea are absolutely garbage from set pieces. And I learned this the hard way last reverse fixture when Spurs and Chelsea played each other and Christian Eriksen absolutely dominated the slate because Chelsea can't handle set pieces. So that's my take right there on Christian Eriksen. Get him into your cash cards for 7.5k. He's absolutely viable. I have no issues chasing him this slate. To further that on Spurs... Uh, I think Sun is equally viable from 8.3K. Uh, is he my favorite play for a GPP stack? No. It's up there because I think of all the teams that people are going to team stack, Spurs is going to be the last team people are going to do that with. And in all truth, they really could tread Chelsea for three or four goals. This could get embarrassing. I'm going to roll back a little bit here to the Brazil World Cup and when Brazil was playing Germany. And if anyone remembers that, you'll remember Brazil's captain was none other than David Luiz, the center back of Chelsea. Brazil went on to lose that game seven or lose the semifinal to Germany seven one and um, absolute embarrassment in front of their home country. And David Luiz lapped up the the spotlight of losing like it was his job. So yeah, um, fast forward to last weekend after years of David Luiz doing, uh, I don't want to say uh, dramatic things, but uh, someone who is okay with losing, he hits the post and runs directly at the camera and smiles uh, to lose the penalty shootout for Chelsea against City on the weekend. So... I don't believe Chelsea is a team with a backbone, and if they start to fold, they're going to fold bad and lose games 4-6-0. to There, I said it. I said my piece. Uh, Is Chelsea completely irrelevant? No, not at all. 
they still do have pieces. I'm definitely avoiding their defense uh, because I don't think there's a ceiling or a true floor. Um, Hazard is viable, though his salary is at that range where, like Pogba, if you fade that, you are making massive prof profit margins. Sorry, excuse me, profit margins every time anything not him happens. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do like avoiding the Hazard ownership. Uh, William and Pedro's minutes have been completely shot now that Higuain is playing up top. None of the midfielders are necessarily viable for either format. Uh, and uh, in terms of Higuain, yes, I do like his 7.4K. Yes, I do like his minutes, and I do like his shots. He is cash viable for me. I'm not going to play him in cash because I think that's an asinine thing to do, but he's doing the right things for cash, and his salary is in the cash place. I'm not doing it. Maybe on FanDuel you can get away with it, uh, but, uh, yeah, definitely not taking the chance on DraftKings. Now, in GPP, someone is going to score on Spurs, and I do like it to be Higuain. I do like him to play 90 minutes. Uh, let's see how things break out here with their lineup. So, yeah, I'm going to say this is tough. 5-1 Spurs. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of being a dick because it's unnecessary. But let's say 2-1 Spurs just to be a reasonable individual. But I really do think Chelsea could fold the big one here and uh, completely go off the deep end for a huge loss. Uh, Christian Eriksen is uh, a lock for either format for me in 7.5K. He's going to be low-owned, extremely effective on set pieces, and playing against a team that really isn't up for it. So you heard what I said. You heard what I said. Next game on the slate, we have Watford traveling to Merseyside to play Liverpool. I don't know what to say here. This is this is another game where you're going to be able to take a massive stand if you want to. The stand this game isn't necessarily that Liverpool are going to lose. The stand is that Liverpool is going to take the foot off the gas, one. And two, uh, Watford are just spoilers. That's what they do. They're the they're anti DFS. They're they're everything DFS players don't want in a team. So let me let me explain. Uh, ben Foster is a world class keeper that on any other team like Liverpool or Chelsea or Spurs or Arsenal or Manchester United or Manchester City would have a legitimate shot at a title because he's that talented of a keeper. On Watford, he's wasted space where. They are more concerned about taking fouls than uh, preventing teams from getting four to six shots on net. That's fine whenever these teams are Brighton or Fulham or Southampton or another useless team. But against Liverpool, these four to six shots are going to be trouble. Um, Holobos is out, which means Messina and Jan Matt will be on the wings. Uh Last reversed fixture, this exact situation was transpiring where Holobos was serving a multi-match ban for too many too many yellow cards, and Messina ended up on Salah, and Salah absolutely torched him for 90 minutes and dominated the slate. So I'll get to that in a second. But in terms of these wingbacks, I see them as false value. I'm not interested. I may take some Jan Matt in the hopes that Mane maybe has a bad game, but I'm far more likely to side on the Liverpool and team stack that before I would take uh, Watt for defense. Now, going back a little bit, if you think that Liverpool are going to take the foot off the gas, which I'll talk about later, Foster is in play because he is a world class, world -class goaltender. But, I, I just uh, I see other value keepers and I'm not interested in going against Salah basically ever. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit further because I do think Liverpool are going to succeed and take their foot off the gas. The midfield is so bad for Watford this late that the guys who do things for Watford are priced below the guys that don't do anything because all the things the guys do aren't going to happen anymore. So the guys that aren't don't do anything are going to just stay the same and all the guys that do do things are priced way below those guys so it's just a really bad spot lots of minutes to get caught up in uh, lots of uh, recency bias around uh, Delafeo who broke the uh, small slate last week but but this is a big but but 
Liverpool, for whatever reason, have decided to just start letting goals in again at home. And that square play I brought up earlier with Man United is going to fall here again where people believe that not only Liverpool will win every game at home, which is likely, but just not as likely, but that Liverpool are spotless uh, at the back end. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, Watford are coming into this with everything available to score a goal. The, the, they're not necessarily coming into this available to win a game. Potentially they could draw if they score a late goal. Uh, but what I'd see happening actually, uh, because why not? It's DFS and these are the kind of things that happen. Troy Deeney from 4.5K with a penalty shot sets you up to take down any GPP if you stack him with another high salary forward. Uh, so, yeah, Liverpool stand to concede, and there's going to be a ton of ownership on them not conceding. The profit margin on Liverpool conceding from a Troy Deeney goal at 4.5K matches nothing this slate. Nothing. It ruins Allison. It ruins the clean sheet for Liverpool. It potentially ruins a Liverpool win, uh, and it forces Liverpool to be in very awkward positions. Nobody's going to own own Troy Deeney. So from 4.5K, I think he makes sense in GPP against the Liverpool side, who do stand to concede. Now, to second that, if they weren't conceding, I think Allison would be a great play. So potentially that could end up being a really chalky play where you can chase him, Trent Alexander-Arnold, and Robertson because they are all viable. Uh, however, I would prefer of the group uh, to chase uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold. Definitely. Uh, if I'm going to be going after anyone, it's definitely Alexander-Arnold. Watford love taking fouls and love giving up set pieces. So for the first part of that, uh, I think Trent Alexander-Arnold makes a lot of sense. He's going to get a lot of crosses, some chances on corners, especially if Milner's not playing. Get Trent Alexander-Arnold into your cash cards from 5.9K. I think he makes a lot of sense. Um, this is where it gets tough. Mi Liverpool plays today. Uh, they play Everton on the weekend, which they need to win. If they lose that game, forget the title race. The title race is done. They're, they're worried about just not being embarrassments for the rest of the season. So they're focused on that. And then after that, they play Burnley, who has shown, despite last weekend's game against Newcastle, to be a thorn in the side of all the bigger teams. And then, three days after that, they have to play Bayern Munich. So they're coming into a stretch here where if they don't show up, not only are they going to be in serious trouble, but they're going to be embarrassed about their results. And their minds are going to be way off before they even get to Bayern Munich. So... It's interesting to see Klopp has been leading on all week that there will be rotation. There is going to be guys that are going to see the field that you're not expecting. So it's tough to know exactly what they are going to do this slate. Uh, I'm expecting Firmino not to play. That's what I'm preparing for. Now that opens up a ton of different formations. A ton of different people like Lalana, Milner, uh, Shakiri, all potentially getting shots at 90 minutes to effective minutes uh enough minutes to see uh really good games especially milner i'm less on the lalana more on the milner and very high on shakiri if he starts this slate but to, to further that sadio mane has goals in like six of his last home games uh, six of his last eight home games uh sala is sala the chances of watford giving up a penalty shot this game are massive huge they're without Holobos, uh and against Liverpool in general, they're going to be on the back heel uh, chasing. And uh, most likely what's going to happen is that um, Milner or Lalana or Shakiri will make a through ball between Messina and the center back or Jan Matt and the center back. And Jan Matt or Messina will be forced to turn around and chase Salah or Mane and take them down in the box for a Salah penalty shot. Salah penalty shot, excuse me. Could even end up on Milner. It's really hard to say. 
Uh, but uh, I do like Sala the Slate for either format as the high salary. Now, let me explain this a little bit further. With so many players to choose from the Slate, I don't expect the highest salary of the Slate to draw as much ownership as he deserves by default. And that's going to dr push a lot of people further down to Paul Pogba and the 9.3Ks which I, and the Amabamayangs, who I think are all kind of traps this Slate. So, yeah, I, I do like Sal a lot. I think he's the kind of guy who can finish with 25 fantasy points off a goal and have a really high chance to not only score the goal, but do so from an ownership that's viable and presents a really good profit margin. Um, I do think, from a GPP standpoint, Dini and Salah make one sexy pairing up front. Uh, I, <laughs> it's, it's really risky. Really, really risky. Here's my theory. I talked about it in my article. I do believe Sal is going to score a penalty shot goal from a very weak penalty shot that's probably going to be a dive, which has been on the up and ups in the past few weeks, especially from the likes from Liverpool. And then what's going to happen is the refs, probably early, this is probably going to happen in the first half, the refs are going to come to realize this was a weak call and they're going to give one back to Watford, which Troy Deeney will take with open arms. So... Am I necessarily saying do this in GPP? No. Uh, do I think it's a really fun way to attack GPP, especially with someone like Christian Eriksen, who again, with Salah, pairing Christian Eriksen and Salah the slate is extremely attractive to me. I think those two together are going to be extremely low-owned, and they're extremely useful, um, unknown kind of players where their goods are really not what's talked about. The goods are going to be the Man City guys doing lots of crosses. That's what people are going to talk about. The goods are going to be Man United doing what they do with really cheap guys, which isn't what's going to happen. The goods is going to be Chelsea remaining perfect at home, which probably isn't going to happen. Um, I just see, yeah, Salah and Erickson together, even if you want to do something like this, and do it in the midfield, I think that's a really, really random way to go about attacking this six-game slate with all sorts of attacking options. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is a really interesting formation for me, getting another forward in there if you'd like. Uh, and, I don't know, uh, final score, I'm going to say a 2-2 game. Liverpool should score two goals. I'll be surprised if they score more. Watford really should score a goal, but I'll be surprised if they score twice. But I, I wouldn't be that surprised. Uh, so it, I think this could go 2 nothing Liverpool, 2-1 Liverpool, 2-2, two, 1-1 two, one, one draw, something along the lines. But I'll be very surprised if this ends 0-0. Zero, zero. Or either team gets shut out. Let's say that. I'll be very surprised if both teams get shut out. That's I think that's a really huge stand to take this slate. Last game on the slate. We have West Ham traveling to Man City. And this is another really interesting game where you're going to have to uh, kind of take a stand. And I think it's logical at this point just to roll with the chalk. And to say that Man City is going to do Man City things. Because they've been doing Man City things. And West Ham... Uh, has been doing West Ham things, which is just bizarre, unpredictable, unbettable things. Uh, Fabianski, again, definitely not my value keeper of the slate. I would rather go Foster before I would go uh, Fabianski and hope Liverpool take the foot off the gas. Now, sorry, I should rewind for a second, uh, very quickly touch on what I think is going to happen. Liverpool is going to get ahead and take their foot off the gas which it correlates to two things. First of all, um, they're not going to continue putting production on the board for Watford to uh, really get back what they lost in Liverpool goals. And secondly, when Watford come back to make the Liverpool defense irrelevant, it's going to make a whole bunch of things irrelevant and uh, make it even more valuable. So yeah, uh, that's why I like Liverpool not to go over two goals Klopp has just indicated that they're not going to be going for the fences here. So uh, unless they fall on it, which is always possible, uh, I just don't see them getting more than two goals. So to further that, I do see City scoring lots of goals, uh, but it's tough to know how they're going to do this. And we'll start with West Ham. Don't take Fabianski. He's going to let in lots of goals, theoretically. Um, 
Cresswell gets his stuff through crosses. You can't really judge that against Man City, who don't allow a lot of crosses. And that eventually crosses out guys like Snodgrass and Fleet Anderson, who make their work through crosses. Samri Nasri is really, really, really attractive to me in GPP this slate. Though I know, one, he's not going to get 90 minutes. And two, he's probably not gonna even going to start. But the thing is that he used to play against... Man City or for Man City and against Man City, uh, so this is a huge game for him to come back and make a, a big personal statement, which he possesses all the talent in the world to do. There's nothing against Samurai Nazri from literally going out and breaking a slate. Is that going to happen? Really unlikely from this age, uh, but and against City, but. Uh, from his salary and ownership, he can definitely set you up from some really interesting things if he gets the start. Uh, to further that, Lanzini looks like he's coming back into form, and he's another player who is going to be low owned, has a low salary, and has all the talent in the world to go out and score two goals against any team in the league. Is that going to happen this late? I really doubt that, considering he's playing like his first minutes in forever. Uh, it say um, yeah like legit like the guy's been out of play forever with a knee injury so I uh, don't expect a lot of things here from uh, the West Ham guys in terms of uh, an outing but just like Dini and even better than the uh, the other the other cats that cost six K or more you're getting these West Ham guys at sub 5k salaries, which is massive. And City is coming off a really hard fought game on the weekend, which we'll talk about shortly. So I know City's the bee's knees. The minutes are really tough, but from these salaries, you can sneak a few risks uh, because they're, they're really not risking all that much. Now, from the City's perspective, <coughs> excuse me. Aguero played 120 minutes, Sterling played 120 minutes, and Bernardo Silva played 120 minutes against Chelsea and went on to win in a penalty shootout. So, are they going to play 90 minutes? Yes, I do think so. I think Sterling in particular is going to see a 90-minute game here. In particular, City is lining up just like uh, Liverpool. They have a massive couple of games, a huge massive uh, Champions League game against Schalke, which uh, Schalke, 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 uh, Schalke, which they need to win. So this is a big deal for them to, again, see some rotation. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, I see the guys like David Silva coming off the field because he's almost 40 years old. I see uh, Kevin De Bruyne, though I like him a lot, coming off the field because he has missed so much time this season. I think they're still trying to manage his match. If they're smart, he's going to come off the field uh, because he, he played a lot of minutes, but not a full 90. Uh, Sané came on the field. It wouldn't surprise me to see him play 90 minutes and be an excellent play this slate from 9.7K, drawing low ownership. I like the team stack theory because West Ham has been really bad, and I don't necessarily see a lot of people jumping on City compared to, uh, for example, Man United, who I think is going to be the go-to for a lot of team stacks due to their low salaries across the board. And when you get to those salaries, eventually you can't own multiple City guys. So, yeah, I, I do like Man City. I think they hold a ton of force in every slate, and they're going to score four goals. It's just really tough to know where they're going to come from. Uh, a lot of this depends on how they line up their starting lineup and who is on the bench. I do predict that Aguero will not start and Raheem Sterling will start as the center forward and will eventually either come off for Aguero or Aguero will come on and uh, Sterling will go to either wing. So it's interesting to see if Bernardo Silva starts, he's definitely coming off. Like there's no way this guy can play a full 90 minutes after that. So what I'm hoping is that Bernardo Silva starts with Raheem Sterling and Aguero. Again, these three all start and we know Aguero and 
uh, Bernardo Silva are coming off or Raheem Sterling and Bernardo Silva start and we know Bernardo Silva's coming off along with someone like David Silva really cutting out the amount of subs that City can use. So my final prediction is a 4-1 City win but two of their goals are coming from uh, the two of their goals are coming from subs. So the ceiling is kind of hidden. Uh, I do think they still possess a ton of floor and West Ham will possess nothing to pre- prevent that floor from taking place. But everything is going to rely on how City line up this slate. That's the breakdown. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. I know this was a long one, but I really appreciate it. I hope you sped up this video. Rob, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter. Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. Rotopros.com. Get over. Check us out. Articles. Top right-hand corner. Drop down. Free content. You can't go wrong. Sign up. Join our Slack. We got some free days on the go. Enjoy it. Please join our community. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Much love, and I hope to see some of you at the top. Good luck, everyone. Let's hopefully take a king of the pitch here and see some more rep here come the end of the season. Good luck.